This month, we talked to mix engineer Chenzo Townsend. Chenzo has mixed singles and albums for the likes of Florence and the Machine, Block Party, Bat for Lashes, George Ezra, and Everything Everything, and has picked up multiple awards along the way. We sit down with him to examine his mix of the Maccabees' current single, Marks to Prove It, and find out more about his new multi-room mix facility, Decoy Studios. So, Chenzo. Hello. Thanks for having us to, uh, to the You're studio. You're very welcome to sunny Suffolk. So, Decoy Studios, where mm. we are, where we're sitting right now, um, it's a new venture for you, isn't it? Yeah. So, do you want to tell us when this actually started up and a little bit about how it came to be? This started, this room has been alive for about four years. Mm -hmm. uh, it was built for a temporary purpose for me to mix while we built the studio and the rest of the barn. Uh, but then I sort of fell in love with this room and have stayed in here, and, but we've built another control room and a live room next door. What would you say is your unique selling point, I guess? Uh, well, a lot of analog equipment, a lot of um, amplifiers, vintage uh, recording equipment, vintage instruments. Primarily we use them for reamping. So basically most of the work done here is mixing mm -hmm. in both rooms. So we have two, two mix rooms. Uh, the live room is, ba is mainly used for, for reamping, and uh, although we do do overdubs and, and bands have come here to record, and I will be using it for uh, co-productions, and it's mainly for our own work. Um, and our unique selling point is, I suppose, tranquility, daylight, and, and vintage gear. And so, do you want to talk us around this room just quickly? What um, you've got a huge SSL here. Yep, this is um, SSL six thousand. G series, which is a sort of late 80s, early 90s desk. Uh, I've had this for about five years now, and it's uh, the centerpiece to this room. A lot of um, lot of analog equipment around a Pro Tools rig, and um, a lot of Neves, distresses, uh, DBXs, that kind of stuff. I'm still sort of very old school when it comes to outboard gear. Mm. I still love my outboard. So, can you tell us a bit about the live room then? Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, it's a spectacular space and it's this really prominent um, acoustic diffuser on the wall which is the log of, diffuser the, the log, log fuser. fuser yeah well the, the, the whole point of the live room was to try and keep it as live as possible and try not to to deaden it David Bell who has a company called White Mark has built some of the most beautiful rooms in the world he did hit factory in New York and mm. Criteria and in Miami and he happens to live two miles away from here so <laughs> Useful. Luckily, he was very useful in in, uh, in helping me make the studio and designing the rooms. Um, and the idea was to try and keep everything as natural sounding as possible and use as little absorbent material as we could, um, and just diffuse the sound as much as we could, so, it's, so it doesn't sound like a, a large empty room. Mm. Uh, a lot of wood, a lot of natural materials. Um, we do have a lot of glass in the room, so that's something we had to bear in mind, but it's mm. something I was very keen to keep. But it's worked. It's it's. We're very happy with it, mm. and he's very happy with it as well, which is great. But that's something that's a feature of the whole studio, isn't it? You've got natural light in all in all rooms. Yeah, I've spent many years in basements um, with no light whatsoever, and, and uh, so I think that was a, a knee-jerk reaction to mm. uh, to oppose that really. And it works. It's it's great. You know, it's you can you can make it work. There's no reason why you can't make it work. You've just got to make that part of the design of the sound mm. of the room, and and deal with it. You know. So how are you counteracting having these big, you know, glass surfaces acoustically? Uh, well, one thing is to to avoid having anything firing directly at the glass, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the the next thing is the the opposite wall to the glass is generally either diffused or absorbent, mm -hmm. um, so that the wave that comes off the glass is doesn't ping back into the room from the from the back wall. Mm -hmm. And how we've done it in this room is just this huge log diffuser, which is. A very large wall of logs, which mm. you'll see, is, it works very well. Uh, and the ceiling, we've used um, some old uh, designs, Russian designs, for some diffusers for those. It's not just the diffusers in the live room that are interesting, as in-house engineer Joe explains. Hi, I'm Joe. I'm an engineer here at Decoy Studios. So we've got the drum brailler above me now. The drum brailler is on an engine hoist, basically, or winch, if you like. And that will go up and down. We can then tailor the drum sound to the track, and if we want it tighter, we can drop it down. And if we want a bigger sound, we can bring it back up or just get rid of it completely. 
And next up, we have the new control room where we meet another member of the Decoy Studios family. So my name's Sean Juliard. I'm, um, I'm an engineer here at Decoy. Um, I've been working with Chenzo for about five years and I moved down with him from Metropolis, so we've been here for now. Um, and we're in the second control room, the new control room. We've got a combination of new and old, um, new being the audience desk, which is fantastically reliable and functional. Um, and then we've got this Neve sidecar, which is full of lovely Neve preamps, 1073s and 1066s, which helps to add colour and character and excitement to the recordings. There's a good selection of compressors, EQ and an effects unit, old effects units, the, um, the Dim D and the PCM80, the Lexicon. Um, then we've got some 33609, some of the Neve stuff and, and LA2A. It's, um, and then some of the more funkier reverbs and delays over here in the corner. So it's a good mix of um, a funky old smelly reverbs and delays and, and nice shiny compressors. NS10s, of course, as with every studio and um, coupled with Chenzo's signature Pure Radio and um, KRK 9000s, which are, which are absolutely fantastic. They get that real low end of low mid thump, um, which are great for drums and, and bass. So it's a good combination of stuff and between the three, you're, uh, you're more or less covered on all bases. So you've got a, another room in the facility, haven't you, it's, uh, called the library. Do you want to tell us yeah. a little bit about... The library about is, is, was born as for, for, to be a vocal booth or a booth, a sort of a deader booth. Mm. Um, the reason why it's called the library is because one wall is a bookcase. Mm -hmm. And the idea came from a house that we used to rent in Bath, um, where OK Computer was recorded and various other albums. I worked with New Order and Manson in, in that house where mm -hmm. we basically um, brought all the equipment, put the desk in the, in the library and turned the library into a control room. And we would do lots of overdubs, all the vocals were done there. One thing I found about booths all the way around the world is that they're not pleasant places to be. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be in a booth. It's almost like sending someone to Coventry if you put them <laughs> in a booth. You know, you send these yeah. So I wanted the booth to be somewhere which people liked being. And so we've also made it to feel a bit like a Scottish gentleman's club or something. You know. um, that, was, that was the idea behind it. And it, now we also use it as a, another mix room for editing and pre-production and post-production. How much of your mixing would you say goes on inside the box and how much of it is using outboard? Uh, well, it's changed a lot in the last few years and, and a lot of it, I, I use, still use the same amount of outboard, uh, although the way I use it is different. The uh, automation is, is done in the box, mm. but um, it, I still use every piece of outboard that you see in here, um, which is quite extensive because I'm, I'm, that's the way I'm comfortable working. and. and the sound that I like seems to come from those bits of kit. Also, so we caught up with you a few years back in Sound on Sound magazine, and you would, in that interview, you talked a bit about the way that you produced drums and the way that you um, had a habit of layering up uh, samples with recorded, with live recorded drums. Mm -hmm. So is that something you're still doing? Yeah, very. I think it's much more commonplace now, but. Mm. Um, I prefer to do it so that the samples remain invisible. I use them for for um, uh, for weight or for crack or for high end or for low end or for mids. But I try and keep the character of the sounds that I was given. I, mm. I, I don't generally replace or generally add different mm. samples. Um, the room here lends itself very much for drum to drums. It sounds great on reamping even through speakers and things. And so we do a lot of that. Um, we use quite a lot of samples that we recorded here just for the ambience, so we'll trigger yeah. ambience as opposed to, or, or for the ambience, the, the room ambience. Um, so yeah, still very much doing the same thing. It, uh, now it's a lot quicker to do, um, uh, but yeah. It seems like there's a, a real British feel to all of the, the things that go on here. Yeah, you know, you're, yeah. you're in the middle of Suffolk, you've got a, a big SSL, you've got yeah. an audience, you use a lot of... Um, Old Neve gear. A lot as of well. old Neves, yeah. Do you think that makes part of your sound using all this? Yeah, it must do. It, it must do. Yeah, uh, it's it's. I do love it, and I um, I feel very comfortable with with old equipment um, uh, and new equipment. We have some um, uh, analog tube uh, Fairchild recreations, which are amazing, hand built by Simon Sayward, mm. uh, very British, uh, in made in South London somewhere. <laughs> 
Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm, I love American equipment as well, old American equipment, but um, Cartech is another company I use, yeah. it's very British. Um, it just happened to like that sound, really. You know, that's, I suppose that's what I grew up with using and that's what I feel comfortable with. Mm. But yeah, it is, it is even down to the, um, uh, I like using high watt amplifiers for reamping guitars and bass, um, uh, Marshalls. It's, again, a bit of an English thing, but yeah. Ampeg's great as well. So, not, not not totally an anglophile. <laughs> so let's talk about reamping then, because that seems to be quite a, a feature yeah. of what you do. Is mm. um, when you're uh, tracking a guitar, so you get a guitar part, do you yeah. always sort of ask for a, a clean, um, de-eyed? Uh, it's nice to have. It's, we we don't require it. Mm. Um, bass, yes, I would always want a de mm. if I if there's one available. Mm -hmm. But with guitars, you quite often it isn't feasible to have a DI. It's difficult with that, with a, the with a, a DI, because one can change the sound completely, and I don't intend to change the sound completely. I just want to mm. give it some air, give it some depth, um, and maybe just kind of uh, knock the edges off it if something's been, if a guitar's been recorded with a plug-in or, mm -hmm. or um, in speaker emulation, I'd rather try and just put it through an amplifier, just literally, to, to amplify the signal and record the air around it, not mm -hmm. particularly to change it. That's generally the idea. With DI, then it's with DI bass, it's it's much easier because I can reamp using clean amps and mm -hmm. dirty amps and distorted amps and and have a blend of all of them, mm -hmm. which is great to use for different sections of the song. The bass very rarely stays static and one sound throughout the song. It generally um, will change, and we record the room as well. We will. We'll, when we're reamping the sound, we'll get a, a mono sound from the B15 as well as a stereo room sound as well. And that'll help in certain mm -hmm. bits, even if we just send it to a, a delay or a spring or something. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's great for that. Do you how close do you try and keep things to a, a rough mix? You take that as a guide, then presumably. Very much so. Yeah, I think rough mixes now have come to a point where they're very close, and it, mm. they're, they're as good as someone can get them. And and our job is to take them a stage further. Sometimes. Mm. I'm told to disregard the rough mix because right. it's, it's, it doesn't really work for them. But generally, it's something that we'll start with and then just try and improve mm -hmm. and, and um, make it bigger, make it more dynamic, um, make it more intimate, but but louder in the choruses, or mm -hmm. just generally um, improve on it. And and uh, sometimes if it involves re-recording material, not in terms of I mean reamping really, mm -hmm. then we'll do that. So I try and bring as much analogue to it mm -hmm. as I can. We'll look a little bit at uh, a track that you've worked on mm -hmm. uh, recently, the Maccabees uh, Marks to Prove It. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in it. It's a sort of high energy. Jam-packed. Jam-packed yeah. <laughs> track. There's a lot going on, yeah. So how do you go about trying to rationalise all those different parts and make them sit together as a, a cohesive production? Well, that song is, is, is made up of three or four very different sections and, and um, there's some much faster sections and slow downs and much emptier mm -hmm. sections and uh, the whole idea of that song for them was to have these huge scene changes but still work as a single, still work mm -hmm. as, a, as a, a pop song if you like. Mm. So it was important to, to find a, a sound for each particular section and then tie them all together mm -hmm. uh, while maintaining this kind of explosive chorus thing. So that was the challenge in, in, in getting the scene changes to work one after another. Mm -hmm. um, lots of very loud guitars, uh, <laughs> lots of vocals, and it's, uh, it's great. It was a challenge, but I'm one I'm very proud of because I really like it. It's a great track. Let's talk about the drums because you've done some interesting stuff with recapturing the ambience of the snare. Got you. Yeah, okay. So the way we recorded that was we uh, replayed the snare through a speaker which is um, held about a few inches above the snare drum. Um, uh, that hits the snare drum, or the sound wave hits the snare drum, it resonates, and then we pick up the sound in the room. We also send a bit of the kick drum to that as well, uh, and to a speaker, so that we get a bit of rattle on the kick drum as well. And cool. I'll just show you what that sounds like. Uh, and so that's the, the drums in the entirety and then this is the sound of the reamped, if you like, snare drum. Uh, 
and then we use one. Uh, that's the snare drum uh, re-trigger and the snare drum and kick drum re-trigger. Which basically just gives a, a, a rattle and a harmonic to the, to the whole drum kit. This was recorded in, in, a, in their rehearsal room in their studio, which is a very dead room. Mm. Um, and uh, it was produced by Hugo, who's the guitar player in the Maccabees and, uh, and the rest of the band. And um, they uh, set up the whole, their whole kit basically to write. So th there, was a, there was no stopping between writing the song and recording it. So it was all done in, in, in one flow, mm -hmm. which is why uh, once we got it here, we then tried to find ways of making the, the kit appear to be recorded in, in, in a liver space than it actually was, mm -hmm. um, without resorting to too much reverb, which I'm not really that fond of on drum kits. Um, so it just gives it that ambience rather yeah. than having any kind of, sort of yeah. overwhelming. Yeah, there's some percussion going on as well with tambourines, again, which, which we sent through our room, the, 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 that room there, through a speaker, and, and uh, recorded that, again, to give it some life, really. This was reamped with a high watt, which is that one there. Um, just to give me a little bit more bite and a little bit more distortion. And we have a, a room for that as well, which has again gone through the, uh, our live room through a speaker just to try and get a bit more ambient through it. Uh, again, this is all bass, so the bass tone changes quite dramatically from section to section. Uh, and then we have guitars. Three guitars. So we have Orlando's guitar, Felix guitar, Hugo guitar, uh, and these take quite different roles in different parts of the song. The, the, the chorus is uh, two riffs, two very clear riffs playing together. So that was quite uh, tricky to get them to to to, um, to mesh. So how do you differentiate those sounds then? They presumably already have some differentiation to them anyway, but how do you accentuate that and make them occupy different spaces? Uh, it, that's, it depends on the guitar sounds, it depends on the playing and what it's playing. I mean, um, luckily, with, as there are two guitar players in this band, they do tend to sound quite different. What's trickier is if you have one guitar player and it, the, the song is multi-layered with lots of different layers of guitars, uh, all played with the same amplifier with the same guitar, that's when it becomes very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the reamping thing or, or uh, even just different spaces and different reverbs and delays. And I use quite a lot of um, analog delays and analog springs, just a, a hint of them, not, not really as a signature sound so much, but just to, to maybe space things in different places, maybe to set things back a little bit with a spring or with a delay. Uh, the Kramer tape delays we use a lot um, I use a lot of Waves plugins. I'm a big fan of Waves plugins, always have been. Um, and their Kramer tape delays are fantastic for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and as are their um, Abbey Road EQs, fantastic for guitars because they're a, a very broad uh, e equalizer and so you, you tend to not do too much damage when you're to the phase of, of, the, of the instruments when you're EQing, which is great. So how important is phase then when you're mixing? It's massive, especially in drums, uh, or drums and bass. Um, so one, I generally would start with, with an overheads if I'm given a pair of overheads and then fit everything into the overheads and check the phase of everything as I put it into the bass drum. And usually now we're often given two bass drum tracks, uh, a close mic and a, and a sub mic, and sometimes even three. So you have to work out the, re the phase relationship between these three microphones first and then apply them within the overheads in the room uh, and the same with the snare and then the same with the, with the higher hats and toms and so it's quite quite laborious and takes quite a long mm -hmm. time but it makes an enormous difference and then the relationship between that and the bass is huge people are often overlook that right. um, just by changing the phase of the bass uh, when you're listening to drums and bass together will change the, the punch and the perception of both instruments so generally you'd look at saying well, I'm going to 
I'm going to check the phase to make sh make sure it's the the bass drum is prominent. Uh, um, if you focus on that, and you you need to feel what you're working with as well. So turn your speakers up and actually put your hand on the surface and feel the difference, as opposed to just hearing it. Uh, and that can totally change a, a mix. Hmm. Um, guitars the same. You're quite often given um, multiple mics on guitars, usually recorded on separate tracks. Uh, which can make life difficult for phase, but it's it's a huge, huge deal. So, the, the relationship between the, the kick drum and the and the bass mm -hmm. that's even if the bass isn't hitting exactly when the kick is hitting, because mm -hmm. there's going to be some natural variation anyway, mm -hmm. isn't there? How do yeah. you account it's, for that kind of thing? It, it just you'll hear it. You'll hear it. Your one way will definitely sound better than another to you, and right. and it depends on on how forward you've got your drums and, mm -hmm. and uh, if the drums are further back then you'll find that one way the phase will the bass will, will sit better and, and stand out more than another in another way it'll sit back and it just depends on on how you've um how you've balanced things and, and quite often it can change when you change a balance quite often you, you've you've arrived at the ba the greatest drum sound in the world and the phase is perfect and you'll introduce another element and you'll throw the phase of something and you'll find that you'll change things around. And it may not be perfect phase, so therefore the, the, the toms may not be in phase with themselves, but they are with the overheads. So that will change the perspective of, of, of the sound of when they're hit. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it's a byproduct of having too many tracks and people being given too many tracks. You know, with, with guitars, when you were working with 24 tracks only, you'd make the decision and, use, and you'd sub you'd sub mix the microphones onto one track anyway. So your phase would never change, it's there, it's locked. Mm -hmm. But being able to change gain between two different tracks, you will also alter the phase relationship between them. And, um, and so what can be in phase one minute, as soon as you turn one of the mics up, will, will change. So it is enormously important. So then with this track specifically, how are you getting the transitions to work from one section to the next? How do you sort of mask those transitions so that it flows nicely? Well, what's great about this one is the band actually played it like that. It's actually played. It's not any form of editing or trickery. So, and they spent a long time making sure that tempo-wise it, it felt natural, going down into the slowdowns and then coming back up into the choruses. So that's half my job done. The, the, the next part of it is, is making it sound natural from an from a instrumentation and from a sound point of view. Um, and on the other hand, creating enough of a scene change to make it stand out and make it odd, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's ambiences, you know, and changing the ambiences and turning reverbs down or, or bringing in different reverbs or delays for, for those specific sections to change the uh, the scene, if you like, mm -hmm. and then drying it back up as soon as you get into the choruses, which would, would bring everything closer and more powerful. Um, as I said before, bass change, bass tone changes, that happens an awful lot in this song. You know, the, the, the verse basses are quite clean and roomy, the chorus basses are filthy. And if you listen to it on its own, it probably doesn't sound very good, but in the track, it, it's exactly what it needs to, to make that transition more marked. Mm. Um, Basically, that's that's it really. Uh, ambiences and and um, uh, and perspective, front to back. How do you get all of these um, energetic elements to sit together in a chorus without it sounding like a total mess? Uh, well, it it is. I find it's quite, a lot, especially with loud guitars. It's um, it's finding uh, frequencies that tread on. Uh, another part's toes and removing that slightly to give room for the other one to work, especially in the sort of two to three K region of notching out certain frequencies. Um, so you do notch, yeah, like a yes. actual notch yeah. rather than just slightly dipping. Yeah, no, we totally remove certain frequencies sometimes, but it'll be very very fine. And and what we tend to do is use plugins for that job. Um, and uh, as you can see here, this is a guitar. This is one of the guitar groups. Um, and we'll, we'll use plugins to do that job, whether it's a, uh, we'll use analog effects to, um, uh, analog EQs for, for general equalization and making something sound brighter or richer. Um, 
Uh, the danger there is that you, you can neuter the sound too much and, and it's, it's, uh, it's quite easy to turn things up very loud and listen to guitars and remove the harsh bits and go, oh, now I can listen to it loud and it sounds great. But you've got to be careful not to take away the energy from it and, and uh, sometimes the brashness and the harshness is, is what the sound is about. So you've got to try and tailor that so it's listenable at a high level without neutering it. And it's the relationship of those frequencies between the guitars. And as you said earlier, the, the fact of having different types of guitar sounds uh, that work together, is, that's, that's the trick, really. So uh, vocal effects on this one in the verses is, um, is, a spring, is a spring reverb, uh, which is uh, Audio Kitchen Spring, which we've compressed a little after it just to um, bring out the tail more so that when um, when the signal still drops it, it allows the tail to come through of the reverb uh, there's a Kramer tape for a little bit of slap delay and a bit of coloring we use um, a hardware 1176 as the main compressor on this voice and followed by a pull take EQP1A. I mean, how uh, hard are you slamming that into the, the 1176? Uh, quite hard. <laughs> uh, I've got one there, the two 1176s, and one is uh, compression over the channel, which is a hardware insert, and the other 1176 is, is a side chain, is a parallel compressor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I tend to prefer using outboard. Uh, compressors to do that, especially the uh, parallel compression. It tends to, the harmonics and the distortion are quite different to, um, to emulated plugins. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you can't do it with that, you can, I just prefer the sound of, of those two 1176s. Um, the main compressor over the bus is the uh, Analog Tube AT1, which is the Fairchild recreation. Um, That's not what, on the vocal bus or on the main? On the vocal bus, yes. Yeah. So I, I'll split the vocals, verse and choruses and any other section, but they will have their own um, compression and inserts, uh, de-essing uh, or any harmonic uh, trickery you might want to use, some drive from various things. We've got a few different drives on this vocal, Devil Lock, uh, an Abbey Road Red with a little bit of drive on it and uh, an Aphex, <laughs> quite a lot of drive going on. Um, on the verse vocals and the chorus vocals, there's, there's less drive, uh, and that's actually going through my Pi hardware insert, followed by an SSL channel uh, for EQ. Uh, again, the Pi hardware is kind of richer than than the plugin I find, or mine is. They're all different. Mm -hmm. um, so each each section of the song will have its own plugins. It'll then go to a master bus, which will generally be um, uh, the AT1 compressor, and that's where the effects go from. So we'll have the spring going from there and various delays, and different sections of the songs will have different effects, um, and different level of, of effects, which is automatable in here, which is fantastic, something that was very difficult to do before mixing in Pro Tools. Do you use compression on your mix bus? Yeah, or? we actually, uh, on this console it has three mix buses, and we have three uh, different compressors and equalizers on each bus, and then depending on what we want to hear, we'll send them to different buses. Um, so the main bus will be a pair of Pultex and a Clarifonic on bus A, which is generally music and vocals. Uh, bus B um, is a, a vocal bus, mixed bus, which will have a Neve 33609. Bus C is a drum bus, uh, which will be the Mag EQs um, and a 33609, I think, Neve. Uh, any of those things can be chained in, can be sent to another bus. So um, the drum bus I can then send to bus A, which will have the pull text in it, mm -hmm. if, if we need to, depending on the type of sound that we want. Um, then that goes to stereo, and the stereo bus has a, a GML EQ and the AT101 Fairchild. It's quite convoluted. <laughs> So you, route, you can route one bus into the exactly, next, yeah. next, right? But so it'll, it'll all sum into the Fairchild and the, and the Massenburg before it goes to the Lavery. So yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, taken a while to, 
to arrive at this system, but um, it works very well now, we're, we're comfortable with it. It also means we don't have one bus compressor. I believe that having lots of different bus compressors in, on different buses doing a small amount of work as opposed to one doing too much uh, makes for a, a bigger sound, and more open sound. You sort of made a name for yourself as being somebody you can mix for radio. Mm -hmm. So how are you doing that in terms of monitoring? Well, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pairs of speakers here and it literally listen to all of them. I have to say most of my time is spent on the NS10s. Uh, the focals are great for for that. They're very um, they're very clear, very loud. The top end is very revealing, which is, which is great. I use the PMCs, 228s, because the bottom end is just unbelievable and the clarity in the bottom end is amazing and being able to pick out drums and bass or bass drum and bass and the phase relationship between the two um, you do need something that is, is very clear at the bottom end and very detailed and those PMCs are unbelievable at the bottom end. Listen to the pure radio a lot because it it's generally sounds like a car radio and it definitely pushes certain frequencies and masks other frequencies mm -hmm. um, and so you can then make a a call on, on how the voice is sitting, which is what it's all about, really. Mm -hmm. Chenzo, thank you very much for having us to uh, Decoy Studios here in Woodbridge in Suffolk. You're very welcome. And uh, maybe we can come back again. Yeah, look forward to seeing you whenever you like. You're always welcome. Thanks very much. Cheers. If you like this video, why not subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel for all our latest video content. Also, if you want to read the magazine, you can pick up a copy in your local newsagent. Download the tablet edition or find us online at soundonsound.com. Thanks for watching.